Oklahoma Gardening is a production of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Southwood Landscape and Garden Center, Tulsa's source for great gardens, southwoodgardencenter.com and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. Today on Oklahoma Gardening, host Casey Hinches is joined by OSU horticulturalist John Stevens, who helps us build a succulent planter from a wine bottle. We continue our tour of gardening in northwest Oklahoma with a visit to the Salt Plains National Wildlife Refuge and a trip to Guyman, Oklahoma to visit a secluded garden made for entertaining and Helms Nursery, which provides the panhandle with beautiful plants fit for the rigors of northwest landscapes. And back home, Barbara Brown quenches our thirst with a blueberry green tea. campus, there's a lot of talented horticulturists maintaining the grounds through landscape services. Joining us today is John Stevens, one of those talented horticulturists. And John, you've got a fun little project for us to do in our garden. Can you tell us a little bit about what we're making? Yes, today, we're, Casey, we're going to make a, a succulent garden okay. out of wine bottles. A small succulent small garden. Succulent. Yeah, okay. Yes. All right. What do we do? Well, first off, Casey, when you're building a garden, you need to decide how you want to display it. Mm -hmm. Do you want it to just be a, a single bottle? bottle displayed? Okay. Do you want it to, to be on a wine rack or do you want to just build your own display? Okay. And that determines how many bottles you need to drink exactly. first, right? Okay. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so we got that taken care of. What, how do we turn this into this? Well, first off, we, we need to cut the bottle. And this is, this is probably the hardest part of the, of the process, okay. is cutting the bottle because you have to keep the glass cool as you're cutting it. Okay. And what I've ran into problems, you, you see articles online, you, um, they, they'll tell you to score the bottle, maybe use like um, fingernail polish and burn, burn mm -hmm. the bottle, but I've, I've ran problems with that because you can't make a clean cut. Okay. So today we're going to use a wet saw that cuts tile and brick and it will, it has a diamond blade in it and will also cut glass okay. and we'll have the nice smooth clean cut. That so we're that'll keep it cool as it's cut yes, through the process. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. All right, so once we've got, uh, do you have to take the labels off of it uh, or anything? No, that's just personal preference. Okay. Um, myself, I leave them on there because I think they tell a story and sure. just kind of add to the charm of the garden too. Okay. So. All right, so once we've got our bottle cut, what is the next step that we need to do? Well, once we have our, our bottle cut, Casey, we need to start planting it. Mm -hmm. And first off, we'll add, uh, a, the soil we'll use is actually a succulent cactus soil mix, okay. um, which the difference between it and, and other soils, it just doesn't have the water holding capabilities that other soils do. It's, it drains, has more sand, more perlite in it. Okay. All right. And succulents are really well made for these small containers because they don't need a lot of moisture, right? That's correct. And if you should happen, you know, when we talk about watering, if you should happen to over water this bottle, just simply just tip it over and the water will oh, drain. Oh, smart out. thinking so there. <laughs> so do you feel that completely full or about half? Uh, about two thirds full. Okay. And then today we are going to plant my favorite succulent, which is called a lifesaver plant. Oh. It puts off a very uh, unique bloom. It kind of reminds you of a lifesaver candy. Hence the name. Hence the name, correct. And I like to use the smaller succulents. Um, you can find them at the big box stores. They sell the smaller varieties and they're easier to manipulate in the oh. small wine and bottle. And they're cheaper too, right? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so now that we've got them planted, you're gonna backfill a little bit? Yeah, right? backfill a little bit more. You want it to just have just a little lip at the top. In case you can find bottles, they don't have to be wine bottles. You can use just soda pop bottles. And, and if you go to antique stores, they have a lot of wine racks, surprisingly, and mm -hmm. colored bottles that it can be used and children would enjoy. 
And once we get to this point right here, Casey, we need to add a, kind of a mulch layer. Okay. And we're going to use, I like to use aquarium gravel. It seems to work very well in, in the bottle bottles. It holds the soil, keeps it from just flying all over mm -hmm. your patio or wherever you display it. And when you have to water, it keeps, it keeps all the soil in. And that aquarium gravel comes in a lot of different colors, so you could really probably get a little funky with it does. this you, if you wanted to. You can make it look really neat if you want to. And children would love that too. Mm -hmm. Just like mulch, that definitely kind of gives it a, a finished look to it, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. And if you really want to get fancy, like we are today, <laughs> we are going to add some Oklahoma Rose Rock. And Casey, I do not recommend watering uh, succulents a lot. Mm -hmm. Maybe in this situation, maybe twice a month. Okay. I usually put just an ice cube in the bottle and just let it melt. That seems oh, okay. to do well. Do you maybe do that twice a month. So yeah. it's it's heavy, so you can put this out on your patio and it, not worry about blowing away in your Oklahoma winds and stuff. And it would do well in the full sun. And exactly. Occasional watering. And we are finished. Now, John, you have this on a used wine rack, is that correct? Yes, that is a used wine rack, and this is just some old wood that we had lying around the barn. And That's a beautiful base, but if somebody was to do a, a single, what, uh, did you make these wood? Well, actually, stands? these, are, you can buy these at Lowe's in long sticks. They're actually for metal roofs uh -huh. on, on homes and barns, and I just cut them to length, and they seem to fit the bottle seems uh -huh. to nest perfectly inside the grooves. They're made to go behind the corrugated metal. Yes, exactly. Oh, very nice. That's mm -hmm. clever. And of course you painted it, I assume. And mm -hmm. Well, John, this is a beautiful display and a lovely addition to any patio garden. Thank you for sharing with Thanks us. Thanks for having me, Casey. just outside of Cherokee, Oklahoma at the Great Salt Plains. And joining us today is Steve Allspaugh, an NRCS soil scientist for our state. And Steve, I mean, let's talk about the soil. You can't deny it here. What are we looking at? Well, Casey, you're looking at probably one of the most unique soils in uh, all of Oklahoma. We have high concentrations of salts here. Um, and it's kind of a, a, a mix of the salt being here groundwater being close to the surface, we get evaporation from the surface of the soil and the salt concentrates uh, at the surface and just below the surface uh, we, we start forming gypsum crystal, crystals uh, which is a calcium based salt and we start seeing those selenite crystals like you're holding there in your hand. So we're in the digging area. A lot of people come out here to dig those crystals. What we're looking at are salt crystals? They are salt crystals. and. When most people think about salt, they think about table salt, right. which is a, a sodium-based salt, sodium chloride. Uh, but there are lots of different types of salts. So you have calcium, magnesium, potassium, and then the sodium salts. Here, it's primarily that gypsum, which is a calcium sulfate salt. And it comes out of the bedrocks in western Oklahoma. We have gypsum beds that formed when the geology here formed under a, a shallow sea. So that salt comes from the west. Um, and then from the north, we have some remnants of the high plains, which you know has the Ogallala aquifer in it, uh -huh. and it meets here along the Salt Plains River. And the water table is close to the surface; we get that evaporation, and that's how we form these plains. Because we the dug maybe a, a foot down or something sure. and saw that water coming up. Right. And so, so is that what then goes to the lake that's just east of us? Yes, absolutely. And. Um, it's fairly common in the western part of the state to find salt affected areas. It's not common to find them as in an area as large as what we have here, but we have a lot of small areas where the water table gets close enough to the surface that evaporation pulls those salts to the surface and then that crust forms on the surface of the soil. Right. So, so uh, obviously salt affects your pH, I mean, and we're not seeing any plants growing right, right. around us here. Can right. you talk a little bit about what that does to the soil chemistry? Um, there's quite, there's a couple of different things that go on. One's chemical, one's physical. Um, gypsum salt really is neutral pH-wise, so it really doesn't have a big impact on that. But our sodium-based salts, when we find those in nature, 
it elevates our pHs, and we see pHs of 9, 9.1 okay. on some of those soils, and not very many plants can tolerate that. Um, the other thing going on here is we have such a high concentration of salt. The salt attracts water, and it attracts it so firmly that plants can't get that water out of the out of the away from the salt. Oh, okay. And so they basically die of drought. Oh. That, so even though we're seeing water, it's not necessarily available right. chemically. It's tied up with that salt. The plants are not strong enough to pull it away from the salt, mm -hmm. and they can't take up the water and salt crystals together. Okay. So, um, so there are very few plants that would, well, obviously where we are right now, there's no plants adapted. Uh, when we get to the edge of the plains, we'll start to pick up some sparse vegetation. There's a few uh, native plants that are adapted to that, mostly inland salt grass and alkali sacaton, which are, are a couple of grasses that we see in various areas of the state. Okay, and I, I wanna answer a question that I think maybe some viewers have is, is this salt usable? Um, it's not necessarily table salt, but uh, they are using it for agriculture purposes? They do. They do some solar uh, salt production a little further west from here. Um, and they harvest that in the fall usually. They grow the crystals all summer, har harvest them in the fall. And most of that is used for livestock salt. So okay. not human grade uh, for human consumption. All right. All right, well, this is a fun place to bring your family and dig a few crystals and just experience a different part of Oklahoma. visiting with Jackie Monk in her backyard. And Jackie, I first have to say, we're actually in your side yard. Yes. And I have never seen such a landscaped little side yard between two houses. You've got a theme going here. Can you tell us about I it? I do. It's, um, it's really just my fun area because I do what I like here. And I've got these statues mm -hmm. with the, the earth, wind, fire, and water theme going on. I don't have a theme with them because I acquired them from my sister and I just, I enjoy them though. Uh -huh. And we love this side garden because when you come into our backyard, which is what we really call our home, mm -hmm. here it is. You've yeah. got this nice area that you can either walk through or walk around. And you're right between two brick homes. I mean, it's really a hot location, um, but you've got a lot of plants that do well in this hot area, this yes. intense area. So your backyard is just so lush back here. I mean, you guys live out here. You must. I mean, we look at this Look at this living space you have. It's just beautiful. It's our favorite area. What is anchoring your backyard is this amazing tree here. Can you tell us about it? This is a crabapple tree that we've had. We've been here 30 years and it was here when we moved in and we've kept it trimmed up. My husband has kept it trimmed up, which I think is what has made it get so large. Uh -huh. And we very much protect it because in this part of the country, we need shade. Yeah, yeah. And it's a great shade tree for us. Well, and you can really see the bark and the structure of the branches and everything. Uh -huh. So it blooms in the spring. It and blooms in the spring and it makes terrible mess with those crab apples in the uh, summertime, but we just deal with it. Right. Well, you've got several seating areas out here. Mm -hmm. um, this is just one underneath the crab apple here. Yes. But before we sit down, I want to talk about this fence over here. I mean, okay. this is just a beautiful, non-traditional fence, yes. but it kind of creates a sense of place here in Guymon. Right, right. The cedar post, uh, or you see them on farms, mm -hmm. ranches a lot, and my husband loves horses and he has animals so we brought that to town and incorporated the fence in our yard yeah that's just lovely and you've got several rocks uh large rocks around <laughs> here um are those from travels or yes my husband most of them have came from my father-in-law's farm down in south texas by waco mm -hmm. 
And we just brought them back as we're down there and we just bring them back with us and incorporated them all around the yard. Well, what I always love about coming and visiting home gardens is mm -hmm. that they seem to be a scrapbook of memories. You've got statues from your sister, rocks from your travels. Uh, so we've got another side of your garden here um, that I want to mention. And just on the other side is a, a train track. Yes. But I love how this, I mean, you've utilized it to kind of mitigate the sound and the sight of that train. Right. Can you tell us a little bit about how this came about? The, when we moved here 30 years ago, we had these evergreens mm -hmm. that were all the way across down to the ground. Oh, okay. So we decided that we were gonna trim them up because I'm scared of snakes. Uh -huh. So my husband took that on. <laughs> and when I came home at lunch one day from work, he had trimmed all these up like this, which wasn't exactly what I had in mind. But as it's turned out, it's it's okay. Uh -huh. We've got two left, and then we've just mulched around them, put our rocks and different things to just make a area that looks nice, but yet also helps with the sound of the train. Oh yeah, there's a lot of interest here. Um, and I'm sure during the winter too, you, you're grateful for those as well to that's right. still provide some green. <laughs> yes, they, they do stay green, one of the few things, so uh -huh. that's nice. Very nice. Well, Jackie, you have a lovely backyard and Thank I might you. want to hang out with you for a little while okay. longer if you don't mind. That'd be great. Thank you for sharing your yard with us. You're welcome. Thank you. Helms Nursery and today joining me is Rachel Scott and she is the daughter of Anita Helms whose vision this was. Rachel can you tell us a little bit about your nursery here? Uh, yes um, my mom loves plants she has since she was a little kid. She grew up in southeastern Oklahoma so it's full of plants and, and flowers and all sorts of stuff there and she just had this vision to sell happiness to people all around the Oklahoma Panhandle. And you get to work here in the, the place of happiness. Yes, This I actually do. started in Goodwell though, right? Yes, it did. Um, we started there in 1992, a little bit before I was here, so a little before my time, <laughs> but we started with a single greenhouse and now we have five out there. Wow. And it's a really huge lot. It, it just kind of goes on forever and kind of like this place does. People walk in and they're not expecting it to be so big and they just keep on going and they think it's really magical that it's just here. Yeah, yeah. And actually we're at the Guyman location mm -hmm. um, and we're at the where the old feed store used to be. Yes. So you actually have a greenhouse snuck back in there uh -huh. and, and a lot of, it's very quaint because it is the old feed store. Yes, a lot of people like that. They come in and see the signs and they remember that the feed store was here and the, the older people of Guyman, they just love it that something is still happening to the store that they used to visit while they were a kid. And this is your main retail location now. Um, down in Goodwell, you, you grow a lot of your own plants here. I mean, the quality of them, the consistency of them looks great. Yes, we do. Um, we grow from seed out there. My mom plants all the seeds. She won't let anybody <laughs> else do it. Quality control. Huh? Yes, she loves to do that. And then we get some plugs in that we grow a lot of our stuff from. We get... Um, some trees in that we plant in our own pots, but a lot of it we do grow from seed. It's really cool. All right, so when customers come in here, I mean, what are they looking for that you guys have? You have some unique perennials and things like that, mm -hmm. but what are they really looking for? They really like stuff that'll withstand the heat and our wind. Um, they like windbreak trees like Austrian pines and arborvitas just to kind of cut back and give them a little bit of solitude from the wind out here. <laughs> you do get a little bit of wind yes, here. Yes, we do. And in fact, we've got a great shade structure mm -hmm. here behind us. Your dad built this just recently? Yes, he did. It's not going anywhere. No, it's not. It's very sturdy. It's from an old um, watering pipe that we have on our farm. So uh -huh. he likes to repurpose all of that old farm stuff and put it up here, which a lot of the old farmers come in and they think, oh, that is really cool. Yeah, I mean, that's an irrigation pivot, the pipe. So yeah. they're, they're pretty solid. Yes. And, and also provides a nice service for your shade plants. Yes, our, our plants love it. It protects them from the wind and the hail and all sorts of elements out here. Well, you guys are providing a lot of plants 
but I mean, are there other nurseries around here? You provide to a lot of people. Yes, we do. There's really not anywhere. A lot of the businesses around here have gone out of business because it's just so tough to grow plants out here. Um, people come from Colorado, they come from Kansas and Texas. As far as like six hours away, people will come and buy stuff here. Well, Rachel, it's a lovely nursery um, here in Guymon, and thank you for showing us around Helms Nursery. Well, and thank you for coming. If you don't mind, I'm going to grab a cart and get a few plants, Absolutely. too. Absolutely. <laughs> Please Excellent. do. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. blueberry green tea. Now green tea is familiar to most of us, but how you make it may not be or how you should be making it. It's real easy to make it too bitter by getting the water too hot. So you'll notice that I've got a thermometer in my water. I want it somewhere between 150 and 180 degrees. If your water is boiling when you add it to the tea, uh, it's going to uh, give a lot more bitterness to the, to the end product. So uh, get it up let it steep for somewhere between three to five minutes, depending on how strong you want it to be. I've got four tea bags, two and a half cups of water, and I'm going to let it steep for about three minutes, uh, and then we'll proceed. Green tea is not going to get real dark, but when we take the bags out, just as you would do with any other kind of tea, you don't want to squeeze them to get that last bit of, of tea out of there. Uh, just let them drip a little bit and then uh, take the bags away. You could do the same thing with loose tea, uh, but because we're going to filter it later on, but you're going to have to, to strain it to get those tea bags out or those tea leaves out uh, before we get that far because you don't want the tea to continue to. Uh, pull flavor from the, the leaves after that three minute mark or so. I've got three tablespoons of honey. The tea is still pretty hot at this point, so I'm just stirring this in because I want to dissolve the honey in there. This is one of those things, again, where if later on you decide it doesn't have enough flavor, the next time you make it, you can add more honey to it, or you could use a different kind of sweetener uh, if honey isn't the, the sweetener of choice. Next thing we're going to do is add about a cup of ice because I do want it to chill down. This is eventually going to be iced tea. So I'm going to chill it down before I add it to a lot of ice so that it will in hopes of uh, keeping it more clear than it would otherwise. So while that is chilling down just to room temperature is all we needed, I'm going to go on with the next step. I mentioned this is blueberry green tea, so I've got uh, about a cup of blueberries here. You could use other fruits. Whatever's in season uh, is probably going to work fairly nicely. I've also got uh, about a half a cup of, uh, excuse me, a fourth of a cup of fresh mint uh, that I've added to that. Now I want to muddle these together, so I want to get the uh, flavors out of the blueberries. You can use a wooden spoon, you can use a muddler. This is actually a spurtle, uh, which is, uh, something that used to be much more common. I believe they were originally Scottish, but it does the same kinds of things. We can mash them together. You could also probably use a potato masher. The, the idea, however, is just to make sure that you mash the mint together with the berries and all the berries get squashed tea. So I'll finish doing this while we wait for our tea uh, to chill down to room temperature. All right, we're gonna add about a half a cup of fresh lime juice to this and stir it around just a little bit so we can get those mixed together. And then I want to stir the tea into there. If you're, if you're serving directly into glasses and you're very competent from here, you could actually do the straining directly into the glass. I'm not there. So I'm going to strain it through uh, back into the original one that held the tea because we want to get all those mint leaves and big pieces of blueberries out there. Now, another thing that I have found with this one is it tastes a little bit better if you give it a little bit of time to mellow out. You can serve it right away, but as I said, it just uh, gives the flavors a little bit of time to uh, blend together and gives you a little bit better flavor. So this then can either go directly into a pitcher, which makes a really pretty presentation at the table, or if you're serving from the kitchen, you can go directly into your glass filled with ice, put a little bit of mint on the top. You could also put a little bit of uh, blueberry floating around in there, and there you have it. It's very refreshing. It's blueberry green tea. I hope you'll give it a try. For Oklahoma Gardening, I'm Barbara Brown. There are lots of great horticultural events this time of year. 
Be sure and consider these activities when you're making your plans for the weeks ahead. Next week, we have a special sneak peek of a couple of homes that will be on the 2018 Oklahoma Horticultural Society's Garden Tour for Connoisseurs. There's an artist home that saves and celebrates water, a Mediterranean oasis just off the fairway, and a shady garden filled with color and texture. All of these gardens are sure to delight and will be an inspiration to go and see them in person during the tour. So we hope you join us then for more TV You'll Grow to Love. To find out more information about show topics, as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure and visit our website, oklamagarding.okstate.edu. And we always have great information, answers to questions, photos, and gardening discussions on your favorite social media as well. Join in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows, as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. And tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater Jewel. We wish to thank our generous underwriters, Southwood Landscape and Garden Center, and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is provided by Pond Pro Shops, Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, and the Oklahoma Horticultural Society. <laughs>